You're watching America's Entrepreneur on YouTube. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Aaron Spatz, and each week we interview entrepreneurs, industry experts, and other high achievers as they detail their personal and professional journeys. Before we jump in, hit the subscribe button and be sure to hit the bell icon so you're notified every time we release a new episode. Thank you so much for tuning in to America's Entrepreneur. So excited that you're joining us this week. Really, really delighted to bring on a special guest to the show this week, Brandon Webb. Brandon is a is a is a absolute treasure to our country, and a lot of the work that he's he's doing, you'll know his name from SoftRep. Uh, he's the founder CEO of SoftRep.com, SoftRep Media. You can learn more about that by going to SoftRep.com. I'll uh, I'll have a link for you there uh, down below. But uh, Brandon spent his time uh, in in the Navy. He was with the teams worked worked as a seal for about nine years before transitioning out and worked for other government agencies for a handful of years before he then began his ventures in in into the business world and so uh, like we already mentioned you're familiar with soft rep he's also uh started and sold crate club group uh, which which is tremendously successful uh what we may also want to take note of is that brandon is also an an author so he just barely released a book recently just within the last month called steel fear and that's available everywhere so i'd encourage you to go pick up a copy of steel fear today and so brandon i just want to welcome you thank you so much for being on america's entrepreneur yeah thanks for having me appreciate it 100 percent. so let's so let's let's go through just a, a little bit of your journey uh for, for those that are maybe not as familiar with the military most of this audience is uh, military affiliated, but are, wait, I, I'm growing an audience of folks that, that are not military connected. So take everybody through a little bit of your military background, your career, kind of what, what caused you to join some of those things? Sure. So, you know, my, I, I don't have, um, anyone in my family who served in the military before me. <laughs> I was the first, uh, my parents were hippies, So, uh, they, uh, they didn't know how, how that translated into Navy SEAL, but, um, you know, I had grown up on boats after leaving Canada. My dad was an entrepreneur and he, uh, he lost business during the Canadian financial crisis of the, I want to say the late seventies. Um, but they decided to pursue their, their dream. My mom and dad, moved, my sister and I on a sailboat. So kind of grew up on boats. I ended up getting a job on a scuba dive boat at a young age. Amazing experience. Uh, probably the first time in my life where I realized that work can be fun. Because uh, I was working as a janitor at a bookstore before that job, uh, which is not a fun job. <laughs> Mopping and sweeping, but <laughs> character building. Um, all that background to why my dad and I got in this huge argument on a family sailing trip in TV when I was 16 and he kicked me off the boat and said, all right, you're independent. You think you know it all. And then there's only two captains or only one captain on the ship and it's me. And, um, maybe you should think about, um, getting off the boat. So I left home at 16. Um, I had always wanted to be a fighter pilot even before Top Gun came out, which just made it worse for me. Um, but then kind of have, having this experience, with uh, growing up on a scuba diving boat, uh, I ended up reading a book called Rogue Warrior, which is the founder of Sinking Six, Dick Marcinko's book, amazing, amazing story. Uh, and having had this like weird academic record, realizing I probably, you know, didn't have money for college and didn't have the grades to get into one of the service academies, fly jets, I, I said, to help it, I'm gonna be an Navy SEAL. So um, I enlisted in 93, and uh, at the time, you couldn't go straight into the SEAL teams. You had to pick a job. You could kind of pick a SEAL source job, which was an easy kind of quick way to, to SEAL training, but those jobs were terrable. They were like cook, um, business made, you know, these, <laughs> these jobs. Like, I'm like, I don't know if, if that's, you know, I didn't I really have a recruiter that knew much about it. Uh, we went to the, the in-processing center at uh, Bakersfield, California. The, um, I remember this little Filipino guy. He's like, "Oh, you have the great asset score. Be a search and rescue former air crewman." And my recruiter, who was a Bose's mate on ships, was like, "Man, that's a great job." So um, I took that. Was a rescue swimmer, trained as a rescue swimmer, air crewman, and uh, helicopters. Did a couple tours with HS6 out of San Diego, uh, which actually we can get into it later. But my first tour on the Abraham Lincoln. 
Um, we had a sexual predator on the boat that was never caught. It was right when they integrated women into the sh- kind of combat ship environment. And that inspired Steel Fear. Like the whole plot behind my book now, Steel Fear, is, is inspired that experience. Um, but eventually, I got my package, my second package approved. They denied the first one um, to SEAL training. Uh, graduated you know, with Bud's class 215, I think. 98 we graduated um and then yeah we started like 220 guys and i think 23 originals graduated yeah. the training has a pretty high attrition rate oh yeah and yeah so that's kind of i could i could go on that's kind of like my entry into the sure into the navy um, yeah but, you know i had a great career i, I did went to afghanistan which is kind of sad today to see what's happening but my deployment in 2001 felt very purposeful. Like we were there to destroy the training camps and uh, put the Taliban out of power, and we did that very quickly. <laughs> and then I came home, you know, and now it's got to look at you know, what's happening in the news, just scratching my head, going, what the hell do we do for 20 years? So, yeah. so it kind of feels like my generation Vietnam with, with a better homecoming, but it's really disappointed in, in the government and foreign policy, regardless of what where you fall politically, I think it's an epic failure on, on many fronts across many different uh, presidencies. So that's the sad thing. Yeah, that, I mean, that's that, that's very well said. I mean, there's just, there's so much that happened over there in the course of 20 years and regardless of political affiliations and, and positions there, I mean, it's just, it, it it's an absolute mess. And, uh, you know, obviously my, my heart goes out to a lot of the folks that are on the ground there currently that are trying to get out, like trying to get the heck out of town. Uh, yeah. because of the, you know, of, of, of the very quickly changing climate there that's going to happen for people that live there. Not to mention, as you said, I mean, all the countless deployments, all, you know, thousands of people that have, you know, that have given of themselves over there. And so it's, it's, it's going to be interesting. I don't know if interesting is really the right word for that, but to see what, you know, in the, in the coming days, weeks, months, but what happens of that place, but man, yeah. I, I, I I appreciate your I appreciate your service. Appreciate appreciate the time that that you did, and then they served served this nation. And so at, at some point, though, you 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 had to have kind of thought about or looked ahead of like to your future. So where where did that decision point come into into play, or what what inspired you, or kind of motivated you to kind of take an exit? I know you worked you know for some other government agencies on on the outside before before like completely hanging it up. But but what what led to all that? I would say the main, I had the main driving factor would have been family. I was, I had a struggling marriage, um, young, young family. And I kind of looked to the future and said, if I do another, you know, 10 plus years and get my full retirement, I'm not going to have a relationship with my kid and, and maybe won't save my marriage. So that played into it. And then that gave me more kind of perspective to see, you know, what was happening in the world. I saw this like big, you know, defense machine at work where you were in Iraq and I saw guys getting over deployed and over traumatized. Um, and that, that it sucks to talk about because this was at a time when America, you know, Navy SEALs and that the military was just America's heroes and nobody wanted to hear about this kind of over deployment and traumatization that was happening. I think we're at a place now where we can talk about it. But it was like America was just like too busy waving the flag and cheering everybody on. And kind of, uh, but I saw it happening and I, I didn't want to be a part of it. Um, I was fortunate enough to, and I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I just did the, the uh, agency contracting because I had a good friend I uh, was able to bring me to that. And it was a very, it made my transition very easy, you know, to deploy for three months and make, you know, almost a year's salary by, by normal standards, uh, allowed me the kind of time flexibility to kind of put my first business plan together, um, take some courses, um, on business. Uh, I, you know, I remember being very intimidated by just looking at a PL or a balance sheet <laughs> and that's basic arithmetic, but it's all for, you know, when you're, um, reading a sniper range card one day and then looking at P and L the next. So, um, you know, that, that kind of, and I was doing the math. I was fortunate enough to take some 
I was finishing my undergrad at night with M. Riddle. I actually achieved my dream of being a pilot. I got my pilot's license, I think, when I was 28 in, in the team. I was an instructor. Um, and I was taking college courses. And I think I took a class on business planning or something. And, and I started calculating out you know, my retirement and realized it wasn't that great aside from the medical. And I, I was thinking, okay, I can, I can get into business and really, you know, do some, put myself in a better situation financially than I would just kind of hanging out, uh, waiting for a retirement check. Um, and when you look at the income distribution in the world, the majority of the, the top income earners in the world own businesses. It's something like 70%. Yeah. So that's what kind of really made up my mind that I was going to pursue business entrepreneurship. That's really cool. So like what, what was kind of like, what was your first idea? Like what was really kind of getting you excited? Like, I mean, so it, so it, actually, you know, but before we jump into that, like one, I just want to point out, like, I think it's really neat that you decide to pursue these things. So like you were, you knew that you needed education, you knew that you needed to gain, you know, upskill your understanding of some things. And so you, you devoted yourself to that, to getting smarter at certain things and you know, facing something that you're, that you're obviously going to be uncomfortable with at first. But then as you, as you jumped into it, like what, what did that look like for you? Like what, what was the first, what was that first business venture? I mean, I've, I've read about it on your website, but I, I just want yeah. you to be able to share it with, with the so audience here. I was, I still am today passionate uh, about real estate and investing in real estate. I had done some investing in small apartment buildings and during when it was at a time in California where it's hard to lose money, you know, everything was booming, but I did live a very practical lifestyle. I, I remember I, we had bought four units in Ocean Beach and we lived in the back unit and the tenants paid our mortgage, uh, which was, which was like really kind of a lesson for me and, and you know, when your income goes up, I like to reduce the expenses, not rise, raise the expenses. I think a lot of people are high income broke and they just, they get a bigger house, bigger boat, bigger car, or nicer car. So I had a little bit of that experience, but my first concept was I experienced the Navy SEAL sniper program moving from Camp Pendleton. Well, actually we were doing it in central California, but we were a guy getting Valley fever. Uh, which is terrible, terrible sickness and ruined a couple of guys' careers. So they can't train here anymore um, in, in kind of inland Valley, California. So we moved to Camp Pendleton. The Marines ended up kind of politely kicking us out of Pendleton. And then we moved our entire program to Indiana. Uh, then I noticed as I was looking for areas to train, Southern California had this massive shortfall of training areas for police and military. So that was my business idea. At the time, I, I said, well, Let's buy some land on the southern border and build a racetrack and some training facilities. And, and so that was the concept. And, it, you know, today, still, I think it would be a successful plan. But, you know, California has, has always been a challenge to develop sure. uh, and be a developer uh, with environmental issues. So the, the short version is, you know, got, got a couple partners. Um, I was the founder, original founder. We raised 3.8 million. We bought a thousand acres, went through a very challenging entitlement slash permit process, ended up getting the permits. And then, uh, the 2008 financial crisis happened. Um, our initial investors like too busy kind of hunkering down, protecting their own assets to put more money in the project at a time where we really needed capital. Then, the local chapter of Sierra Club sued the county for approving our project based on what they said was a was a BS in, uh, environmental pro environmental study, which we paid a quarter million dollars for and had no input. I think the county chose who did the report. We just had to pay for it, so um, it was just kind of a mess and and kind of collectively along with some partner infighting, um, killed the whole project. So it was a tough pill for me to swallow because I had, you know, almost four years invested in this, um, really tough for me to take. Um, and 
I just had to realize I just need to move on and chalk this up to a learning experience. And once I kind of made that realization that I had now essentially a, a street street MBA, <laughs> I, was, I was like, I knew how to raise capital. I knew how to borrow money from the SBA. Um, I knew you know, much more about business. So that, that gave me the confidence to kind of think about what my next opportunity was. But in all practical matters, like I got divorced, I had to get a job, I ended up um, getting a, a job with L3 Communications. It was an incredible opportunity, more money than I made in my, my life at that point. And it allowed me to kind of build up my nest egg. And, and then my side hustle became blogging. I got into digital media through, through writing and blogging and got the idea for software uh, through working with military.com. And then I realized, okay, I can do this and, and kind of did it on the side enough to get to a point where I could step away from, from my, uh, executive job at L3 and start software. Cause that the initial idea for software was there was all this interest in the world of military and special operations in 2012, but there was really nothing on the internet. You could play the video games, buy the books that were starting to come out. But there's a, people were fascinated with what, what was happening, and out, outside of a few obscure military forums where they would kind of like yell at you if you didn't get your your terminology correct, <laughs> they were kind of like jerks to the average Joe. And I was like, that's no way to be. So Software started as um, kind of a, a site that would cover historical missions, interviews, and then we did start breaking some news as well. Uh, because we had we had all the sources that were everywhere, um, and we could beat the New York Times on, on certain stories. So that that was an interesting kind of transformation that I didn't expect. Yeah, um, still kind of we have a healthy balance of kind of you know what I would call story interviews, op eds, and occasionally we will make a big story. But that's that's kind of my <laughs> what got me into to software. Yeah, that, that's that's incredible how it started. You know, it started off as one one idea, and then just because of the nature of the sources that you're that you have access to, sometimes coming across information or or things that are developing sooner than most other outlets. So I think that's 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 a pretty fascinating angle. And and to go back to the original to the, to the first business concept, it's I think that's that's an experience that a lot of people you know, can either. Like wither from and they and they withdraw and they never want to go have another shot at something else because they you know because they had a really tough experience but your 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 mindset shift there in terms of like hey like like you said like i got got a street mba this is a learning opportunity growth opportunity and once you're able to kind of reconcile that mentally then you're able to kind of move forward and then and then in, in the midst of having a job and side hustle writing then it just kind of it just kind of grew i mean how did it even grow like what was the like, what was the mechanism behind all that i would say I, I owe a lot of it to my time as an instructor the sniper instructor we had transformed the seal sniper program and had access in, to some of the best and brightest minds in performance sports uh, a good friend of mine Lenny basham who was a gold medalist um, really taught us about mindset, and he built a whole mental management program that, that he won the world with. And that was really centered around positive psychology. And so I, I would say that that was a huge influence on me, um, not not kind of throwing in the towel on our yeah. because it was that moment, life savings gone, wife left me, now what the hell do I do with myself? It was a, I was a low, a low point for sure. And I think the only one of the things that's, that really helped me was was a uh, just understanding um, how uh, positive psychology impacts uh, your your thinking and performance. And I just made a decision, and I had had a taste of the freedom of entrepreneurship. That was the biggest thing. I I went back to corporate and was like, this is not for me. I, I'm I'm going to be an entrepreneur. So. That was a kind of a pivotal moment for me. I, I did write a book called Total Focus, which talks about in detail my my journey 
in, kind of into entrepreneurship and starting to have some success because I think a big part of what I, what I was struggling with, you know, as a kid that probably would have been diagnosed with ADHD, um, I, I was all over the place. So I, I was, I had all these opportunities I was chasing, um, you know, as a SEAL that was out early and kind of people were wanting to put me on boards and start this company and that company. And I was getting pulled on all these different directions. And I realized I got to focus on, on one opportunity and see that as to a success. And I think it's possible to pursue multiple things once you have had some success and kind of strong foundation to build up. A perfect example of that is Elon Musk, right? But when you have hundreds of millions of capital to deploy, you can buy a lot of resources and, and capacity. But when you're starting something out, chasing 10 things at once, it, it, I, I think it's a, a real um, tricky situation to manage. And in most cases, it will probably fail miserably. Um, and I've got a bunch of examples in that, that put total focus. Yeah. Well, then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll link that up below as, as, as recommended reading. Cause I think that is a, I, I think that's something that plagues a lot of entrepreneurs, especially first time young startup entrepreneurs where it's like, you've got a million different ideas, but then I think in, and again, this makes into the book. I, I apologize if it does, but like, is this, do you see this also happening on the other side, like on the reaction as the entrepreneur, as you're going out pursuing business and you have people asking, well, do you, do you also do this? And then like before long, you like you've added like an entire buffet of things that you maybe didn't really intend to. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, that that always is a challenge. And that's why I think it's so important to, to invest into strategy, um, spend most of the time on strategy, then the rest kind of becomes much easier because you just learn to decline um, those, those kind of distracting opportunities that come up. Um, and now having, I mean, I remember we did a whole exercise uh, I'm in this program at Harvard Business School for for entrepreneurs um, and executives, and you know we did a whole exercise on you know we were stranded in you know the simulation we were stranded in the middle of the Canadian wilderness, and and it really taught me how important strategy is because we were so like we spent all this time on all this meaningless crap, and we realized we never had a plan at the end of the day, and we had, we, had, we ended up all dying in the simulation. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, strategy is, is, is so important. Um, and, and I think that's, that's like goal planning as well, right? Like if, if, um, if something, an opportunity comes up, and it's not aligned with your, with your goals. You just got to, it becomes an easy to climb. You're like, okay, this, this either is aligned with my plan or not aligned. And if it's not, then, Hey, um, I'm going to pass on the opportunity. Uh, that's just, just how it is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and it, because what you've done is you, you've already pre-made that decision. So it's like, okay, yeah, this, this doesn't line up with what I, with what I'm pursuing. So, okay, this isn't, this isn't gonna be a great fit. So, uh, I mean, that's solid advice. So, so let's, so then let's, let's re uh, refocus our attention on to soft up. And so as that, as that began to grow for you, like, what did you see there in terms of like, okay, like things were starting to get like get a lot of traction you did you find yourself in a spot where you were like needing to hire people to help you know edit and write and do all sorts of different things yeah i mean it, it, i've had the business now eight years i have learned so much from the soft rep experience um mostly i would say one of the biggest lessons i've learned is about hiring like everyone now gets personality tests um we're very you know, pretty strict on, um, you know, just process the process of hiring uh, to make sure that we don't have a bad hire. Because in the beginning, I, I made a ton of bad hires. Like, I mean, I, I I'll be totally honest with, with your audience. Like, we ended up hiring two drug addicts. Like, one one guy ended up overdosing and dying. Like, another white, real bad stuff and, and total totally disrupted to the work environment and morale. Imagine, you know, somebody that you invest, the company invests in, the team invests in, and everyone finds out this person has a real substance abuse problem and, and ends up overdosing. I mean, that's not a morale booster. <laughs> so, um, yeah, these are all things that I really, which is kind of naively going. So I, going along with, but 
learned a, a ton of lessons about hiring, not necessarily um, putting people in the roles that you want them in, more like, are they suited for this role? Um, that's where these, there's a variety of different personality tests that, that really measure people's strengths and weaknesses, and we, we all have them. Um, but that now is a backstop for us to make sure, okay, this person is the right, has the right character set for this, this role. Um, so that, yeah, that, a lot of, a lot of lessons learned around hiring. Um, what else? I, I also, yeah, I've still struggled with, you know, with a little bit of focus issues. Cause there was a time where, um, Crate Club came on the scene, uh, about, I don't want to say like 2015 or 16. Okay. And it just took off. I mean, it was an eight figure business in two years and we just shifted focus to Crate Club and then software kind of took a back seat, which I think was in hindsight, a huge mistake. Um, another mistake I made was we didn't raise capital fast. Like I bootstrap both companies, but Crate Club in hindsight now clearly needed a, a big injection of capital, uh, because we, we ended up becoming a victim of our own success. We were, we ended up having a, you know, this massive subscriber list and having running an asset like media company, carrying no inventory, all of a sudden we're managing a complex supply chain and, and having to purchase product and really manage cash flow tightly. And, and we really needed to, to like hire more people. Yeah. And that was a lesson, right? For me, like, okay, we, either you grow a little bit slower, you slow down the growth, or like many companies that hit hit fire these days, they get this injection of capital so they can hire, kind of stay ahead of the growth and hire the people and, and get the resources they need to kind of to, to manage the growth. Sure. Um, but ultimately, you know, Crate Club. Um, it was at a point where you needed capital or I needed to sell it. And fortunately, um, I was already in conversation with a competitor of ours. And when the pandemic hit, I, I knew we were going to have even bigger supply chain challenges. So I ended up selling it in 2020. Um, but yeah, and then now we're really refocusing on, okay, what, what, what makes software great? What do people really love us for? and really investing back into this business, which um, is nice because, you know, we, we do have an online store where we carry no inventory, everything's drop ship. <laughs> so it's a huge weight off. Really nice, man. That's that's, yeah. that's great. Yeah. I don't have to look at $2 million of product in the warehouse that is just sitting there with cricks chirping going, what the hell do I do with this stuff? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a that that's a problem that you don't have to worry about it anymore. So it's uh, that and that, I mean that that's a whole nother it's a whole nother set of just complex complex issues. And so no, that I, I really appreciate you kind of providing some of that contrast because it, it's the, those are those are very different like ways that the businesses were were run. It's like you've got you got something that doesn't require any tangible assets, and you got another one that's completely supply chain dependent and you know, very very heavy there. And so I, I can imagine how difficult that is to like maintain focus between the two because there's just there's a lot there's a lot going on there but but you know going back to your hiring like that i think is i, I think that's something that a lot of people have to learn and, and unfortunately it, maybe it's the maybe it's our lesson to learn but my my question for you though is like when you're bringing somebody on and they you know, they take personality profile and, and you're, you're looking at that is are, are there any instances where they've applied for this role but you're like man like Love this person, but not for this role. They would be great for this role. Yeah, what does that happen? Uh, yeah, yeah, it happens. Um, it happened to us recently. We we were staffing up our writers, and we just happened upon a guy who was a good writer, but also had an incredible uh, marketing background. And I just promoted my CMO to CEO, and we we're kind of like he, he could do both jobs, but um, you know, we found this person. We're like, okay, we're, we're gonna. And actually, their dream was like to do much more than to write from the site. So it worked out for both of us. But that, that was an instance where we're like, okay, this, this is this person is super talented. He's into it. Um, can help us with all sorts of merchandise, branding, um, marketing efforts, social media, and and so yeah, we're so I think it's it's good to kind of keep an eye on that. And and you know, they're 
cases where you have really smart people and, and they're and they're they're willing to kind of like pitch in and do other things until that right spot opens up for them and that that's a possibility too. Uh, I do believe in promoting from within the organization. I I've met enough case studies to understand, you know, the companies like Southwest versus United Airlines, Goldman Sachs versus JP Morgan, um, uh, like a McKinsey, Boston Consulting, it's like amazing cultures they built within these organizations. And it's because that they train and hire and promote from within. And there's this like culture of performance, but it's, it's about the whole team. Whereas like a JP Morgan compared to Goldman, it's, it's very like dog eat dog. Um, everyone's out for their own thing. And, and you don't, you don't, you end up with a culture that's, that's not a very good team environment, you know? So I, I think that that's, that's super important to think about also. Um, but I, I'll tell you this, I think, you know, my, I come from a long line of entrepreneurs. My grandmother owned a collection agency in the seventies in Los Angeles. My mom became an entrepreneur. She was always kind of a side entrepreneur, like opened a restaurant, sold a restaurant, would do these side gigs and ended up building a, a nice size uh, coffee and tea manufacturing business with her, with her best friend that they sold, uh, like SBA woman of the year. And she's cool. an amazing inspiration to me. My dad as well. Um, but, uh, having said all that, I think there are so many opportunities out there as there's different ways, different paths to entrepreneurship. If I was giving advice to myself, getting out of the military, I would say, go educate yourself on the basics of business and go get a business broker, apply for an SBA loan and purchase a cash flowing existing established small business and grow it because there are tons of businesses for sale that have been around for years and years. It just de-risks the whole process. You can, in most cases, you can borrow the money from the SBA and get owner financing and not even put money out of your pocket. And you can buy a business that will generate, you know, probably 100, 200, 300 K in owner's discretionary income. Boom. You're in business. And a lot of these businesses, the, the parents own it, the kids don't want anything to do with it because they went off to college and they're doing their own thing. And the, the parents just want to like, owners just want to give it to somebody. They're ready to retire. You know? yeah. but I, that's something not a lot of people are talk about because everybody wants to go raise money and start some sexy tech business. And I, I love these like boring businesses. My friend from Harvard, Xavier, he owns this uh, gasket manufacturing business out of France and Switzerland. They make these tiny little rubber gaskets for like all the luxury watch companies, um, all sorts of like um, engineering businesses, like just the most boring business, but it's so profitable and it's, yeah, they have such a niche because um, they're making gaskets for years. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> this is, I, don't, I don't care about the sexy, you know, yeah. sexy tech business and, you know, Ping pong tables in the lobby. Um, yeah. Anyway, That's awesome. sorry. Yeah, that, that, that is a phenomenal perspective, and I'm just I'm done, I'm done over here because you're like you're you're nailing it right on the head. Is like there's this the there there's been this culture that's been created amongst the entrepreneurship community that I that I've noticed, and I think it and I think even like you know a lot of big names in business have even pointed this out. Is like you know going going and raising a ton of money, taking like a massive massive gamble on a you know on a tech idea. <laughs> Is not all that it's cracked to be. Now, there's, I mean, there's tons of winners out there. Thank God for them. But I think to your point here is like it's real. It's there. There is something to be said for taking something that's that's in existence, proven track record, has a has a solid customer base, solid employees, and it's just it's just it's just chugging along, man. It's like I think that's a that's a great great idea for people that are curious about the idea of business because you don't have to stay with that thing forever, right? I mean, you could you could buy one of these companies, operate it for five to ten years, and if you're like, you know what, I think I think I've run this as far as I like to run it and cash out. I mean, like, is that your perspective on that? Yeah, I think that's an option. There's many. There's I, I remember this guy I met when I was just getting out of the military. Uh, he owned. He started with one White Castle franchise, and now he owns like 150 of them. So, right. 
or you start gobbling up your competitors and you yeah. know, go either horizontal or go vertical integration. 200 million plus business, like the guys, the guys rocking it. So there's all sorts of directions to take it, grow, grow it, sell it. Um, maybe it's the kind of place where you can, you've kind of now learn the business and you can go start acquiring up small companies and it's by assembly, take it from a small business to a very, very big medium or, or large size business. So. Huh. Um, That's but, a really cool perspective. Yeah, I just think it's, you know, America, all of our, um, you know, all the ugliness aside that, that we've seen last few years, it's still an incredible place to uh, build a business. The opportunity is still there. The freedom to, to build or buy a business is still here. And, and the marketplace, everybody in Europe, and the rest of the world wants to be in two markets. It's, it's North America market and China. Um, and so, yeah, it's, we're, we're in a great, um, we're in a great time. Um, and especially for these military folks coming out, they have such good skills, leadership management skills that, that if they just do a little bit of homework, they can be great, great owners and operators. Yeah. That's a, solid advice and perspective there i'd like to uh i'd like to should focus just before we jump to your book i want to there's another question i want to ask you which was um you know we we talk a lot about our challenges we talk a lot about lessons learned and i'm telling you you've been you've been shelling out some some pure gold here and i really like i really appreciate all that but, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> but no i i I, I, I wanted to actually kind of turn attention to like some of your proudest moments, some of your biggest achievements. I don't think we, I don't think we talk enough about some of those sometimes. And it's like, there's, there's, you know, for, for every, I mean, it's like we, we, we do 10 things right in any given situation, but there may be one thing that we screwed up on and we're going to, we, we spend a lot of time focusing on that. And I think, I think that's great by the way. I mean, there, there is something to that to always get better, but no doubt there's been a lot of things that you've done right, Brendan, like through your career and through these ventures. And I'd, I'd love to understand some of the, some of these things from your angle of like, Hey, these are some things that I've seen other people do wrong and I either learn from them or, or I just, or I was just a great calculated, you know, guess here and, and, and following my intuition and I really happy how that worked out. would love, love to understand a little more about that. Yeah. So I would say kind of two things that come to mind recently was, um, the crate collects that I was involved with an investment bank. Um, they were brought in and hired to help me um, raise capital. But when I realized with COVID, the, the capital climate was changing, uh, that I needed to sell. Um, and I had a relationship with a potential buyer. Um, I fortunately knew I had some experience with bankers in the past and they provide a great service for, you know, doing whether they're selling or helping you raise capital. But in this case, they really pushed to kind of get involved with, with the sale. And I, I knew that they would slow me down and I already had a great relationship going with, with the potential choir at the time. And, and I had enough confidence and know how to make that decision. Very tough decision to, to tell a bunch of alpha, alpha bankers back off. You're out of the, you're out of the deal. Like I'm doing this myself. Um, and I ended up selling with help from my, uh, my finance guy, Randy. But we did the deal ourselves and we, we had it done in, in a very simple contract, lawyers out of the mix, you know, other than you know, reviewing final docs. So that, that I see as a really good accomplishment that I'm proud of. Um, and then, and then on the topic of the book, like Steel Fear, um, I had a lot of success as a nonfiction author. My friend and editor at St. Martin's Press, Mark, was like, hey, why are you doing fiction? Just stick with nonfiction. You're good at it. You got a, a pretty good fan base, but I have this, I, I, I think I'm also a, a creative person. Um, and I, I wanted to like explore this, this creative streak in me. And I said, I can, I can do this. So I started writing a book and then a guy that I write with, um, I've written with in the past, John, I, I brought him in when I was, you know, about, I think just under 20,000 words. Um, and the book I think finished is close to 90,000. We turned it 150,000 words, but yeah. a, a, you know, a good quarter way through the book. And when I asked John to help me, cause I just, uh, I just wanted to get it done. Um, 
And, and so again, like we finished the book, people were like, oh, what do you guys know about writing? You're both of you are nonfiction guys. Um, but then we just pushed forward and thankfully our agent believed in us and, and uh, we started getting some really good feedback and we ended up selling Steel Fear for a record advance in the middle of the pandemic. Like we sold it, I think, May 2020 for more money than we'd ever made uh, on a project before. And, and, you know, and then we sold the TV series of Peacock right behind the book, the book no sale. It's a random house, yeah. So uh, NBC Universal is a Peacock, is our streaming network. Um, so I just think it's, it just shows you that if you're persistent and you believe in something, that, that it can be off. Um, and so I'm, I'm really proud to kind of bring Steel Fear into the world. The thing that I didn't expect was we ended up a, with a series. Like this is kind of or like a Jason Bourne slash Jack Reacher origin story. So our, yeah. our, our character Finn lives on. Like he's, we're already in book two and planning book number three. So I'm yeah, pretty, pretty excited about this um, and what's to come. That's super cool. That's a, I mean, that's a great, those, I mean, those are two really, really awesome accomplishments and it's uh it's really neat to see the pivot. I mean, cause that's, I mean, that is a big leap going from you know, nonfiction to fiction. And so I was going to, I mean, the perfect segue is like, you mentioned it earlier um, in our conversation, a little bit of the origin story of steel fear, but kind of if, if, if you want to elaborate a little bit more on that, feel, feel free to, but just love to kind of understand the, the genesis of that and, and what, like, just what inspired you to go after this specific type of genre? So, the other thing I would say that that we did in a book, kind of not thinking about, but because it was based on such real events, like Steel Fear, you could teach a leadership course off this book. Um, and I had, I was on James Altucher's podcast, and we talked about. He said the same thing. Um, so that's an element that we want to carry forward into the series. Um, I'm a huge Ayn Rand fan. I love her kind of, you know, philosophy on entrepreneurship and, and free markets. Um, and so that's something we're going to continue to kind of carry on, you know, as, as a theme um, as we go forward. But so the, what inspired the book, I was on the Abraham Lincoln, which was a nuclear aircraft carrier. It's my first deployment on a carrier. Um, it, you know, I, outside of our squadron and, and some of the the folks on the ship who are great, the Lincoln was at the time a very like drabby environment. It, you know, the captain never spoke to anybody on the one MC, which is kind of the main intercom of the ship. Um, we had the highest accident rate, I think, in fleet. We had an at sea collision. We lost an F-14 jet on approach. Pilot pilot died. And we just played with all these issues. Then to make it even more interesting, we it's the first time the, the carrier is deploying women and, and 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 we have this this pervert on board running around like assaulting women at night. Um, and they never caught the guy. And and then I remember finishing that deployment, getting my being really bummed up because my my buds package got denied. My squadron, like, no, you're too important, you have too many qualifications. Which is a lesson I learned later in, as a leader. Sometimes you have to reward your high performers. You can't punish them because they're so good and so qualified because that's what happened to me. Um, I ended up having to do another deployment and applying to SEAL training all over again. And I did this deployment on the Kitty Hawk. And I remember thinking to myself, great, I'm going from like this terrible ship that's one of the newest in the fleet. Now I got to go on this conventional aircraft carrier, which is, you know, I think. I think it was built in the 60s. Don't quote me on that. But, yeah. but it was old conventional. And I'm like, this is going to suck. And I get on the Kitty Hawk, and I was like blown away. Like It was so much nicer. The ship was cleaner. The morale of the crew was high. And we had this great cat on board. And, and it was instantly recognizable to me. Like, this guy is just a good leader. He's talking to the crew every day on one MC telling us, oh, this is where we're going next. This is what we're doing. And like the communication was there and morale was high. And, and thus you had this like old ship that was incredibly well run and a great, a much greater work environment than the Lincoln. Um, and so that was like a big lesson for me um, in leadership. And that's something that we talk about is, or 
becomes very apparent to steal fear because the main character Finn's noticing this kind of leadership dynamics, good leadership, bad leadership. And and, and the guy that's in charge, the captain of the of the Lincoln and Steel Fear, he's this careerist guy, he's kind of mediocre. He wants to be the smartest guy in the room. And he's like creating this environment where this serial killer, because I that the sexual predator behind gave me an idea like what if it was a serial killer? Yeah. It's Ham Ham Electra like her. And so but his bad leadership created this environment where the serial killer could just kind of thrive and wreak havoc and, and that's what happened in Steel Fear. Um, that that's the whole thing, what inspired the book and um it's kind of cross runner. It's a military thriller and kind of a crime, almost like Tom Tom Clancy and Agatha Christie hooked up, had a baby. That's that's kind of like so. It's a little cross genre. That's cool. Uh, that's cool. Yeah. Well, that's some good. That's some good company, and I'm uh, I'm excited excited for you with the uh, one. We're just getting such a great advance. I mean, on book one, it's already turning into a series. So, no doubt, there's a. Uh, there's plenty more of the story to be told, and I'm man, I'm I'm so 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 excited for you, um, in in the way that's heading, and um, and I just I, I think you you really are like a great example for those that have exited the service. No doubt, there's challenges. We all we're all going to face challenges. There's all good, there's always headwinds in in life and in business, and so it's like you you've no doubt gone through plenty of those. You're going to go through more, I'm sure, but also being able to you know, rebound from those, reassess reattack and you're continuing to move forward and so I, th I think it's i think it's really neat to kind of see your story and i, I just me like looking at you like hearing you talk like i still feel like we're like early like i still feel like there's so much more for you out there that's that that you haven't gotten to yet that's gonna happen and i'm uh i'm excited to see where where, where all this goes for you so thanks yeah yeah but um but so what's the what's the best way for people to get in touch with you if they want to follow you follow what what's going on I'll, I'll throw the book title up here as you're as you're sharing this with me but i'll i'll show you this is the uk cover which is kind there of you go. Cool. that is cool yeah, yeah. that's a super cool but, cover. um brandon tyler web.com just my full name.com um i'm on instagram at brandon t web and twitter brandon t web i i'm very active on instagram uh, I I don't have one unanswered DM. But if it's a respectful uh, question, I, I typically will always answer back and get to it at some point. Um, I I think that's kind of I mean maybe that change if I <laughs> if I become too successful. Right. But for now, I manage it and and maybe I get someone to help me. But I, I do like that. I feel like obliged to to answer back if it's a person asking me advice on. Um, on entrepreneurship or about the book, I, I don't mind. Um, I did have a funny, a guy even wrote to me, he's like, hey, I think I'm gonna be in jail. Like, can you tell me what happens in book two? I was like, I think they have a library in prison. Like, <laughs> 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 I didn't even answer that. I'm like, okay. yeah. Oh, that's awesome. That's so awesome. Well, well, Brandon, it's been a it's been a been a true delight. I really, really do appreciate you making making some time to uh, to, to spend with me, sharing a little bit of your a little bit of your story, and uh, you know, we, wish you nothing the best. Can't wait, can't wait to see how how the rest of the story plays out. But thank you again so much. Thanks, Aaron. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to America's Entrepreneur. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a review or comment on your preferred social media platform. Share it out with friends, family, coworkers, others in your network. And of course, you can write me directly at Aaron at boldmedia.us. That's A-A-R-O-N at boldmedia.us. Till next time.